Art Brown with Game Maker's Toolkit, a series on video game design. The Metroidvania is so in right now. From Ori in the Blind Forest to Zeo Drifter, indie games are helping to resurrect this dying retro formula which involves wandering through maze-like maps, collecting new abilities and using them to tackle obstacles that were once impassable. But I've been playing one recently that captures the feeling of a classic Metroid game better than any other. It nails the sensation of getting lost and stumbling into weird new environments and simply not knowing what's going to be around the next corner. That game is Axiom Verge. I'll try not to spoil it in this video, but I will be showing some different areas and power-ups if you're sensitive about that stuff. Now, when I first played the game, I couldn't quite put my finger on what made it so evocative of those treasured Nintendo games. Surely there was more to it, right, than the knockoff 8-bit art and the trippy sci-fi setting. But then I replayed some of the other recent Metroidvania games and I figured it out. I realised that while many of them slavishly emulate Super Metroid, almost all of them ignore the most important thing about that game. It didn't tell you where to go. Where that game let you get lost and made you create your own maps, you know, paper ones or just mental ones, these games guide your every move with overzealous hints and markers or even paths on your in-game map. B5. B5. Got it. Now, to be fair, even Metroid did this in later editions as both Fusion and Zero Mission basically told you where to go. And I'm well aware that what worked in 1994, when the internet was barely even a thing, doesn't necessarily work so great in 2015. But this... Okay. Who paused it? Oh no. I did. <laughs> that was Adrian. Yeah. There was a couple of things uh, he said in there. I think probably the one that I might take issue with the most is that was the most important thing about Super Metroid, that it didn't tell you where to go, and I'm not so sure about that. The other thing- that, I mean, that's such a subjective thing. I think that's just part of the premise. I mean, you, you kind of have to look at what Super Metroid does to get you from major section to major section. While there's lots of secrets and stuff and some non-linear ordering you can do, like if you go to the ghost ship at a certain point in game or if you go somewhere else or whatever, you get the power-ups early, so on and so forth, like the game has some pretty major sections that they kind of guide you through. So it's not like you don't ever know where to go exactly in Metroid aside from a few uh, key points where the world opens up and you, gotta, you have a few non-linear choices to make, but for the most part you follow the, the pathing within each area and um, it kind of flows somewhat linearly especially compared to the original Metroid that's a game where you're like I don't know where to go because all these hallways look the same and they're 18 miles vertically and I have to jump across <laughs> a million platforms to go through a similar looking hallway what's this door do? I'm lost do you like that game? I don't I, like <laughs> I thought his point was more that other games were explicit about it yeah. Somewhat, yeah. But that, was, we're saying that's not the, the, what makes Super Metroid so good compared to those other games. Yeah, okay. that's where he flows into his next point in that um, he seems to really... It, he can't, really intolerable of the idea that um, they have hints or anything on a map at all. And even mentioning Metroid Fusion and Greg, you should know firsthand that I managed... that those map markers don't help all that much because i still <laughs> get stuck in that game anyways so and the other thing is that the further you go in that game the less they tell you where to go like at all like to the point where they yeah. don't even have the ball anymore so yeah and then it's shadow complex i think they say something about you can turn off the hints like right at the beginning so you can play it you know if you want to get lost and wander around yeah Which, metroid uh, prime does that too it, it, but it's different. It's like, it's got to be conducive to the kind of game experience they're making. Sometimes when they have a default feature like that, there are a lot of areas you can just wander into and go, well, I wasted my time. But then it's different when you're like, I know where I should go. I'm going to waste my time. And you go and explore anyway. And uh, sometimes the, that, the difference between turning a feature on or off like that could be a huge sort of negative because you keep getting lost and just do everything via trial and error or you know when you're going to intentionally go off the path and you can quickly get back onto on the path if you want to because ultimately exploring is just trial and error i don't know why people like it so much or think that not knowing where to go is so intellectually stim stimulating 
It's like you don't know where to go. You just guessed. You picked a random hallway and then you went down it like everyone has to. And you said, oh, can't do anything because you tried everything. And then you went out of the hallway and did that to the next one. There's nothing special about that. Now, it's kind of cool to draw maps in Super Metroid or the original Metroid because I drew a map by hand. But it's only cool. It's only it's as cool as the game is. And then it only becomes particularly interesting when some element of non-linearity opens up and you go wait i think i saw something back there and you use your map to get there and it's maybe something that wasn't absolutely necessary for progression but because you kind of kept up with all the details you could make your experience a little different than maybe somebody else's and that's your choice to kind of navigate back and then navigate forward but really the trek back in the original metroid isn't that interesting and there's a lot of repetition and so on and so forth so like the ability for a game to guide you and give you hints is checked by its ability to be interesting in the first place. Yeah. And that's where Shadow Complex fails. <laughs> oh, I still want to play that game, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think probably the only thing that I might give him a little uh, leeway on is that um, I, I know Thomas App, when we interviewed him, actually specifically brought up that game. And it wasn't until I saw this video that it, oh no, it it's not that it's throwing a random ball. Here's another thing about them um, complaining about that with Metroid Fusion is that whenever they do the marker, oftentimes they throw it off into like nowhere on the map. Like you don't have a map yet. So it's just like zero mission to that, whatever. Wait, oh yeah, no, I'm sorry. I forgot about the marker in Fusion as well. Yeah, because they throw the marker, but it's like your map doesn't go there so you still have because it's like in this gray space of nothing around it so it's like oh i have to go into the blank part of the map where i have no information of what the, even the rooms are so there's still like it gives you like a general direction but it's not exact but the difference with shadow complex that i saw in this video is that oh it actually draws a line through the mini map of where to go which mm -hmm. is definitely the most extreme I've seen so far and that's probably the only one I'll give a le little leeway on is like okay maybe it doesn't need to be that explicit it's... I mean it's all kind of relative to even if you show them the exact path they need to take to get to the next point it's mm -hmm. like it doesn't mean that they there aren't secrets to find or not different ways to get there um, that are off the beaten path or whatever right so like it's, it can all be subverted or part of a, a more complicated system of, you know, revealing and then concealing secrets. It just depends. But, like, ultimately the basic idea of pointing out the player where to go, you know, it's, it's more complicated than just, like, now my game is ruined. Yeah. Well, I, I understand this video more to be, like, there are a bunch of different ways to do Metroidvanias, and this person has chosen to highlight one where there's no like explicit marker system communicating to you where to go hmm the thing i hey. would yeah ask well, is we gotta see it once we watch the rest of the video i mean okay <laughs> yeah adrian I'll... kind of stopped it and we kind of blame him i'm sorry i thought because it sounded <laughs> like he was about to move on to a new point but i'll continue the video and see if it, he expands on anything he said here but this is a huge part of what makes Super Metroid so terrific, and it's what makes Axiom Verge great too. And we also see the benefits in a game like Bloodborne, so this video is not just for side-scrolling games that look like they should come enclosed in a hunk of plastic. These games let you set out on an adventure, choosing your own direction and your own path. And when you stumble upon a new ability or a boss room, it feels great because you got there. There wasn't a big flashing waypoint on your map screen, it was all you. Or was it? Because neither Axiom Verge nor Super Metroid really drop you into a maze and let you run wild. In reality, they just give you an illusion of exploration, offering lots of different doors and paths that are actually dead ends along the path to the next goal. But what about when you unlock a new ability? When your brain races to think about how this will affect previously visited areas, just like how you reconsider everything you've seen in a movie when you hit a plot twist. You're the one responsible for choosing which area to return to, right? Well, you definitely have more choice in this instance, sure, but still, these games have techniques to push you in the right direction and send you rushing back to the next critical room in your journey. That room might be memorable in some way. This area in Super Metroid, which is where you need to come back to once you have the high jump boots, has an imposing gargoyle face for a door, which should sear it into your memory as somewhere important. 
And in this room, you get momentarily trapped between a pair of closing gates. That brief moment of peril should make it stick in your brain, if only because you want to come back and show those stupid doors who's boss when you've got the speed booster. Putting the room on the cusp of a new environment is smart too, as you get a teasing hint of somewhere exciting to come back to. Another clever trick is to hint at the correct application of your new ability when you get it. Most games in this genre copy the old Metroid trick of doing away with tutorials by just locking you in a room with your new ability and forcing you to use it to get back out. But you also see things like this, when you get the Ice Beam in Super Metroid you are forced to freeze this little guy who just so happens to look exactly like the critters you need to freeze to move. So, um, his points were that... Sorry, I'm just trying to... <laughs> My brain's a little slow right now. What were all of his points there? It seemed uh, like he went through three different ways of com like inexplicit communication. Yeah, he started with like, yeah, these games, you know, getting lost and they don't tell you what to do. That's what's unique about them. Then he said, or is it? So, you know, everything that we said. Um, <laughs> yeah. <the> first pause, <laughs> which is kind of set us up for this conversation. But he's saying uh, the games guide you a lot. So whether it's like, hey, look at these mile markers. That That's what helps you remember what areas to come back to in the classic. You get a power up Metroidvania style. They say, hey, look at this room that you're trapped in, uh, but that room has lava in it. Mm, lava, you can barely see it, so you can come back later and go, ah, lava room. I remember being trapped here because I was scared for a moment and frustrated. Stuff that's like it. that. Okay. So that's like a place where you'd put a marker in uh, Axiom Verge. Yeah, I mean, it uses its, um, red its what dead ends and redirections to build these significant moments in the player's mind so that even without explicit uh, mile map markers, you know, you're building... Um, you're building key location-based uh, memories so that you can more, be more likely to come back to it later. The, uh, the I guess, well, what's striking about those his examples were that uh, some of them like have an important gameplay context where you might see a ledge is too high, and so you ponder your ability to get there. And mm -hmm. some of them have importance just in. And being consistent with the world itself, where like you might remember that a certain location looks a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, and in Super Metro, you like your auto map gets filled out when you go into new areas, so it's really not hard to find out an area that has another area next to it for the most part, because that it'll was, be the. Uh, that that was ultra important in Axiom Verge. Axiom Verge is the first game, like, like the first game with a Metroid-style map where I've gotten lost and. Actually, just going to every open edge on the map has, like, allowed me to move on. Mm-hmm. It helps. Mm -hmm. I also think, um, these examples that I was showing here, um, probably do benefit more from the... Well, I actually, I, th I still think only Shadow Complex is the one that would have an issue if it's drawing a line, so you won't experience moments like these if it draws a line that makes mm. you go past the rooms where you can encounter these in the first place but what i was going to say is even with the waypoint marker thing this kind of stuff still happens which is why my idea of what i was going to say to greg earlier was even if you put map markers in super metroid the way they do in fusion and zero mission even though i haven't played it uh you would still get the same effect of going to rooms is is this where i go to get to that bottom area way down there where i don't know how to get there and you can still stumble upon these things and then learn yeah, metroid to fusion, them later uh, metroid fusion does a lot of that where they tantalize you with like oh i bet you if you had x power up you could do this yeah that game has a, a lot of ways of um faking you out <laughs> sometimes it's just a hole in the wall that you need to pay attention to i felt really stupid about that one and another weird thing about the way that uh, Mark Brown is explaining this, it's just the whole idea of like, oh, look, it's about exploration. Actually, it's about tricking you. It's false exploration. Like, it's not false exploration. Yeah, I thought like, that was weird. Don't, he said it make illusion. a weird, like, false dichotomy in the first place. Wait, yeah. in specific, didn't he say, like, oh, it's all about finding it on your own, or is it? Like, his... <laughs> yeah. that doesn't sound like it. At one so point, he, he's, he's, I guess ahead, it seems Andrew. like uh, the his argument is against the player who doesn't realize how much the game is communicating. Yeah, but 
the yeah, the language he's using to even describe both sides of his his little flip flop there it's just like the game is actually tricking you into with uh signposting and all this like uh false exploration because it's actually guiding you like quit calling things true and false exploration like stop that yeah <laughs> okay. been like this. at some point uh, along the way when people started talking about these games they tried to use true and false to make these very poorly articulated um differences between some games and the others so they're like oh true mario 3d platforms real fighters they're like okay you guys it that doesn't make any sense so like and then now people are like guess what these are t or these are true platformers too you're like we don't need the true and he's like guess what it's not really a true platformer like stop using the term it was a bad term in the first place it's, it's not really not a true term <laughs> <laughs> it's not, uh... yeah basically that's what i'll have to say like people kind of get off the point when they start fighting arguments that shouldn't have been made in the first place okay yeah so i guess to i only had one last thing to add and richard kind of addressed a lot of it and that was at one point the exact phrase he says i think was actually the illusion of exploration like the mm, exact yeah. phrase of words and to me well i'm like that just still just sounds weird to say because i mean exploring it's it's still exploring like yeah. i don't know i don't know what your definition of exploring is that somehow being guided somehow makes it not exploring like even yeah. in a game as linear as mario having a bunch of pipes that you can jump into like i would still consider that exploring yeah. nick if you ever uh you know if you ever run into any trouble and you think of it um you can always mute yourself on the uh, oh, button at the top that only mutes myself i was thinking for a moment it muted everyone no Ooh. that's just you. oh okay if you want i can Sorry. actually mute you myself if you want to mute other people, you go to their profile and then you mute them just like this. Watch. Don't do it. <laughs> just like that. Now, now he can practice unmuting himself like a Super Metroid. Uh, yeah, he did it. Check challenge. So congratulations. This right really gives me the illusion of exploration. <laughs> the, the illusion of actually having a voice and talking to a person. <laughs> Yeah, but like Adrian's saying, it's it's all still exploration, and some people kind of get wrapped up in. Um, sort of a thematic idea of uh, of an action and then the practical definition and they're like oh exploration needs to be where I'm in a world where nobody else has gone before like what makes you think that like exploration needs to be in a place with no maps and nobody tells me what to do like what makes you think that people explore all the time places people have already gone <laughs> and discovered yeah. and signpost and give them hints and guides for like the Lord of the Rings go to the mountain and toss in the ring. Oh, now it's not a journey because you told me what to do. And you're like, just do it. <laughs> you're gonna figure out your own way there anyway. Yeah. I was just gonna say that sounds like an issue of discourse where like someone feels the need to validate or invalidate a term, and instead they could just say like, uh, I prefer to talk about this kind of exploration, maybe. Yeah, but the the weird part is like. It's not necessarily a kind of exploration. It's just other things that help frame the whatever overall experience. But it's not necessarily a quality for, to, or against the exploration part of the experience. So it's just kind of like not understanding what it meant in the first place and taking like a macro feeling and trying to, trying to uh, not not uh, refine it down to where it means exactly what it's supposed to. So like, oh, some people think, like, they watch stories and like, oh, it's not an adventure unless, uh, you know, I lose my map. They're like, well, well, that doesn't have anything to do with whether or not it's an adventure. And like, an adventure is a very simple thing, just like exploration. It's a very simple concept. That's why we can apply it to a whole bunch of different things. Try not to add too many extra things into it and just say like, I like adventures that, and so on and so forth. I like exploring when we add extra words, because that's what words are for. <laughs> yeah. sentences. I think part yeah. of his argument is also that it's that he that the multiple pathways type style that some games have, like Metroid's kind of very clear and it's not clear. It's like has a set path, and he's like, oh, this isn't super exploring, but it's pretending to that I'm exploring my way through it. But in reality, it's a big path I'm just going down, and I don't think that's fair because I think exploring should count even if it's a set path. Yeah, because, I mean, when you think about it, like, what is 
exploring really well it's just like in its most actually i should say it's the most specific way to put it but it's a really general term for just saying like uncovering stuff you don't know what's on the yeah. other side of this door that's exploring and i, even I if define it's a, it as uncovering the unknown it's the unknown to you not the unknown to anybody else yeah hell that doesn't even need to be like physically moving through space that can just Correct. be something like a move list or what are my combos in this game that can also be <laughs> exploring when you really think about what that word means yeah it's just checking things you don't know is everyone Some good people call that learning mm. <laughs> yeah along the critical path put two and two together and you're back on the trail axiom verge sometimes provides more than one room that you can return to with your new ability but they both lead you to the same critical path i'll show you what i mean when you get the high jump ability you can use it to get up here or up here. Either way, you're led to this room. By giving the player two opportunities to commit a room to memory, the game has doubled their chance of getting to the right place. Metroid's pathfinding trick is these navigation terminals that fill in just enough of your map to hint at areas you should explore without spoiling all the secrets. And if you really do get lost, these games put barriers behind you to quietly reduce the number of possible places for you to check when backtracking. They might be very temporary barriers, like the way doors lock behind you in Super Metroid when you're in a critical room that contains a puzzle. This is Nintendo's way of avoiding a common pitfall with Metroidvanias, where players don't always know if they can overcome an obstacle with their current skills or if they need to come back later. By getting locked in until you figure it out, you're left with no doubt as to whether you're able to pass. Or they might be barriers that lock off huge parts of the map. In Axiom Verge, you might not realize when you hop off this platform that it's too high to jump back up yep. until you get a future ability, locking you off from getting lost and wandering back to the beginning of the game. Or until you get the, uh, you reload your save. Without the ice beam, which means you're stuck in a hellish volcanic area called Norfair for a good long while. But revisiting old areas shouldn't be dull or tedious anyway. New abilities like the grappling hook and the speed booster let you move more quickly. You should be able to open up shortcuts. And level design tricks like Super Metroid's hub and spoke system help you navigate the world more easily. And going back the way you came can be made more interesting too, like how this section in Brinstar is littered with enemies on the way back. All the design kind of talking about something else. Altogether with a nice loop around in the level design. So there he was highlighting like different aspects of map design, right? Yeah. Yeah, like how you get upgrades that makes going back through this one area faster so that revisiting isn't, you know, tedious. Or, um,. Folded level design, you know, like in Wario Land 4 or Metroid, where going back through the same area carries a different challenge with it, either because you're holding something or because you got a new power, because you got the speed booster, whatever. Um, I don't know what other variations you could have. I guess you could do the Castlevania style, which is mostly horizontal horizontal hallways uh, to navigate, because Castlevania is kind of modeled after a mansion. But then the only other style I can think of for a 2D um, Metroidvania style game is one where it emphasizes vertical hallways. And you do that by having the sort of the hub and spoke style uh, level design that Mark Brown commented on. But either way, mm -hmm. it's kind of um, it's similar, right? You either have a horizontal hub with vertical inlet, so you have a vertical main hallway with horizontal inlets. Then you orient yourself by sort of the largest or most dominant sized hallway so it seems like that's still talking about how we can uh like read a level then choose to explore or walk through it or whatever yeah um yeah mark brown usually like... starts off with a, a very a focused narrow topic and then by the half like the end point of the, all his videos like this he just sort of says whatever's on his mind so like it gets further and further away from the the narrow topic and okay, like you're saying, Greg, right. we're just getting more and more into general comments about Metroid's level design at this point. Okay, I, I, I was afraid I was the only one with this feeling. It's like, it, doesn't it feel like he's kind of getting away at the point he was making at first, which was, you know, talking about getting lost in games and why, you know, Waypoint Marker sucks, but now he's kind of just talking about map structure or level yeah. design and just like yeah, Metroid I, games in general, Waypoints or not. That's his well, And it's like... Not then like it's not an irrelevant topic it's still up at talking about like how you approach 
big interconnected worlds that don't have a, a guy telling you what room to go to. Yeah, or but kind of, <laughs> kind of. It's just like here's a way we make games where you get lost, but not really because they put you back on the right path. Yeah, like and if he wanted like, to stay more on topic, he would have had to contrast the hub and spoke style level design with any alternative, right? Any. <laughs> and they were like, we didn't see the contrast and be like, oh, so that must help X Y Z point that he made here. But now it's just kind of. I mean, we we paused it, but he just seems to be going through a list of things. Uh, that he observed about Metroid, but it doesn't really actually build to his point. So he could have showed and... like a screenshot of Dagger Fall and been like, and here's a thing that has no hubs or spokes. Yeah, like, is there a Metroidvania, 2D Metroidvania game that's like a big open space? Maybe co contrast that with V, 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 or contrast that with uh, Ori in the Blind Forest, or contrast that with something. And uh, I'd have been like, oh. But then, then he'd have to figure out where people got lost in those games and maybe contrast that with their uh, signposting and tutorial systems. And it's kind of like a huge topic. And I think it's because mostly um, the idea is the worlds aren't that complicated. They do give you hints and maps and that um, they do funnel you to the areas you need to go. So regardless of what kind of physical layout your maps have, all those other things are more important for getting people lost or not lost. And that kind of makes his comments now about the particular shapes of the metro levels less and less relevant because whatever the shape is the hints are what's going to help you the most in the in the visual design and the in the dead end design and all that mm -hmm. and kind of the main thing i was waiting for in this video which was what he was opening it with was why is getting lost or being able to get lost important or why is that fun I was kind of waiting yeah, for something. Took that for granted. Yeah, I think he just hinted like, at like you do it yourself when you stumble upon the solution. You're like, yeah, because I got lost and then I had to do it myself. I got lost yeah. myself too, but I'm not proud of that. Like the closest <laughs> point to ever addressing that question is like you did it all by yourself, all on your own, or something along those lines. And that was the most for it. And to me, I don't know. Whenever I do something, or I don't know. I, I would imagine there's more to it other than saying I did it by myself because that just sounds like a. It's just know, a, a pretty common shallow. response in uh, in our current <laughs> rhetoric where people are throwing around like the fact that you did it in the game that their deaths are your fault. It's like a weird, uh, sort of bad criticism that people have been leveraging. Uh, and it started around I'm gonna say five years ago. There's a quote by Miyamoto that came out that talked about why action games are so good. And he was talking about Mario and the fact that when you miss a jump, you know it's your fault because Mario is a really meticulously designed game that feed, has feed, clear feedback for everything and your jumps are obvious and enemies are simple. And then you, when you die, it's like, yeah, it was my fault. And people started throwing around that phrase for everything they felt like was a skill-based game, but it doesn't apply to things that are just skill-based games, it applies to games with clear feedback and, and, and consistent fair mechanics, right? So then people mm -hmm. started throwing it on Dark Souls and they started throwing in all these bad games that have garbage, garbage traps and tricks and stuff oh. and bad controls. And now <laughs> when people respond to it, they say, oh, like, or what, what was the quote from Mark Brown that we were talking about? You just said it, Adrian. Oh, about I did it, me all by myself, oh, yeah. that kind yeah, of thing. So it's an extension of that so when people say like oh you, you know this game's good because when you do something you did it to try to make some false um distinction between like games that have tutorial versus games that don't and somehow when they don't tell you what to do you did it and it's more you you're like not necessarily and then it's the same with um with these other terms like oh it's fair because you did it because you got through it and it was so hard like it doesn't mean it's fair like it's not a necessarily a good thing to just slap on the you did it at the end of a difficult accomplishments it, it's about how fair it was and how interesting it was that's what's more important to consider right if i was to contrast this with another thing i read that i thought was super interesting it was our good friend daniel and his piece on resident evil and what it's like to explore that mansion and keep track oh, yeah. of all the different locks and things going on and why people keep referring to it as like a puzzle even though it's not really a puzzle like nobody's gonna have trouble put thinking oh use the fire extinguisher to put out a fire but what makes it so interesting is keeping track of all the different locks and where the things are and 
how you route yourself through and what and all the zombies and keeping track of your resources. I gotta but, um, reread that. Yeah, but to me, like, I would expect something like that because when I think of you know Metro games and Richard, you mentioned this earlier, is like um, these rooms that leave a cle- a distinct impression on you and remembering to come back to them later after you get a power up. Like to me, like that's something. Well, that's not even getting lost really, but. That's something specific that is interesting about this game. Mm. Yeah. I think people falsely equate getting lost to, um, I don't know, they, they falsely equate getting lost to a game, tr- treating them with respect and all these other sort of garbage phrases people are throwing around. Like, <laughs> it doesn't mean any of that. And, and sometimes they say, well, if the game's hard and they don't give me any help, then that means I did it all on my own. But like we were saying before, like getting lost is a thing that you should take pride in. It's like, did you have a choice? Did you have a chance of not getting lost? Were you not paying attention to the right things? And how fair was it that the game led you into understanding sort of its particular way of providing hints and guiding you, right? Because if a game doesn't guide you at all, it's just a big open blah, like, right? That, that you know what it, it is? What? It's that godforsaken final palace in Zelda 2. <laughs> I wasn't like uh, you're you're getting into the realm more of like aesthetic preferences though. Am I? That and, that was and, just and like well, I meant more what Richard was talking about. But... Oh, I don't what do know. you mean aesthetic that... preferences? Like to say that a big open world where you have no choice but to get lost is bleh. Like, I mean, that's oh. fair if you don't like it or if you do like it. Well, it's not it's not really about aesthetic choices and like the the conversation isn't well what if people like that like that's not even that's not even worth considering like sure we already know by default anyone can like anything and on the internet defend whatever so like it's not the fact that people like it we're talking about how it works and then more specifically what i was talking about was why specific phrases have turned up in our discourse and why uh, when other people use it, it seems to be like lacking of substance. It's because they're being made in response to something, things that are poorly defined and poorly understood. And then when you keep adding on to things like that, phrases and concepts that you just get a sort of a mess of non-specific uh, comment commentary. So in this case, people falsely equating getting lost with a game respecting them is a weird um, association to build and it's you it's probably because games like dark souls came around and you know in demon souls and there's that initial area in demon souls where you can wander easily wander into an area way higher level than you should be and people have been known to play it and get their butt kicks and wonder like this game is just hard and it's not for me when they just literally wandered into like world five instead of world one and they don't have the skills the know-how or the equipment to take care of it and some people say like <laughs> That's such a good design. You should have known you were uh, too weak for that. You're like, how am I supposed to know that? I, I don't know anything about this game, and everything that everyone says online is is so hard. But you gotta stick it out and bear, grit your teeth <laughs> and do it. So then I grit my teeth and lost over and over. And then some people think that's a good thing, right? But the underlying issue is, it's e- much easier to understand. The game just gives you a choice of wandering into areas you um, are just too strong for you. It doesn't tell you and there's really no good way to figure it out other than blind trial and error or talking to someone online. So like, that's the reality of it. And you could, yeah, okay. you could, you could prefer games to not be afraid to like waste your time or to send you down wrong, huge areas of like of wrong over or when you're underpowered, overpowered zones or whatever, like all that. <laughs> all the you want it, you can like it, you can tell funny stories, but ultimately the underlying issue is the game is not helping you. And, if, you, if you're there to play a game and, you know, learn and build your skills and sort of appreciate that kind of common gameplay experience, then these are the things that aren't helping you do that. Okay. I can see yeah. that, yeah, very well. And I was and I was bringing up my example of Zelda 2 because that is an example of there's this humongous palace, a lot of dead ends, and this actually kind of helps me understand Richard's point about earlier about how exploration um can be a little overrated in some ways where that palace is just check this way dead end check that way dead end check that way dead end check that way dead end because that palace is humongous and <laughs> greg i think greg you and richard or was it wario fan i don't know all i know is that one of you guys in here were with me when i was going through that uh four hours of pain trying to get no greg you were with me because i asked you <laughs> where to go and it was not it was not pleasant 
and yeah that was an example of a game where i'm just like where do i go and it's this really cheap like uh it, it almost felt like a prank in some ways too <laughs> yeah so and uh, richard you were actually saying something earlier about oh it lets you get lost and it's like it's just right you know that felt like a, a dick move to me when mm -hmm. it, and it didn't make me happy realizing that either and unlike some of the other dungeons where there are actually villagers that are giving you hints um that one doesn't and that one really does just feel more like uh the game's not helping me and then it also goes back to another point you were making earlier about you know what's in between that exploration and that was kind of your joke about shadow complex but that also made me realize just the the weaker aspects of zelda 2's gameplay mm. i rolled a lot of little things into that but um it, ha it has to do with getting lost and the difference between that kind of getting lost versus the supposed getting lost in super metroid and axiom bridge yeah i wanted to uh, contrast with those that's a good point it, it's kind of like are you getting lost because you had no choice and the game is just a series of uh, random options and you just guess and check your way through or are you getting lost because you didn't pay attention to something and the game was trying to help you learn the particular details and signpostings that it was using subtly or are you getting lost just because you simply forgot something like all, all those are sort of different considerations and yeah. um and another thing that's been rising up in the discourse the whole not being afraid to have your players get lost is something that's been circulating around Starseed Pilgrim and Jonathan Blow's games, and it's something that um, our friend Alexander Martin or Droken was talking about Starseed Pilgrim, where he's not afraid of having players utterly get lost. And then, like, Jonathan Blow comes in, like, Yeah, let's make more games like this, you know, just be pure to yourself and don't be afraid of players getting lost. You're know, like, Well, there's a difference between again getting lost because you forgot something or just the game throwing creating an environment where it's not even conducive to learning and it just makes that whole process. Uh, filled with more trial and error, which sort of delays the entire thing the, and frustrates the experience. And we've already yeah. written a lot on Star Seed Program, so we know like its intro has some questionable elements in terms of learning and pacing. And we can't, and some people, like, I don't really think that's a good thing. Like, people have such a hard time with Star Seed Program anyway. Like, you can still put a lot of mystery into the game without, um, without making, deliberately making it harder for the player. And like, it's mm -hmm. all a balancing act. But there's some give and yeah. take you can do, and and if you're gonna go with a minimalist style as a developer, you should probably hit your marks perfectly, like as perfectly as possible. Yeah, I would still say um, no, no, no. I think you're right. It's a balancing act because the thing is, um, Metroid. It's one of the big differences between the first Metroid and um, Metroid and Metroid Two, and then Super, which comes after them in that I still think the whole it's just a bunch of left and right hallways and you got to make your way through these complicated tree branches and it really is just you know guess and check but even that I still think is okay but it's way easier to overwhelm the player with that versus you know the what do you called it hubs on spokes yeah and spoke that super metroid does it because um to me like, I think Zelda 2 is where I definitely felt that going overboard because, you know, that thing was so long and I have a time, I have a recorded t amount of play time to even show you just how long it takes to go through that. And then even in the video, me forgetting which press have I already checked versus in Metroid where that time was significantly shorter. And that's the whole thing about the balancing act is how many of those left and right branches and then like what's the standard game playing between them because one of the reasons where i would contest that the original metroid might fail in that is just because of um some of the difficult like if i didn't have the screw attack in metroid the point i got it that probably would have been a much bigger pain in the ass i think but um because i yeah, did i found I mean, it much I easier to go through those mazes the screw attack gives you well, it makes the game easy enough that you can spend time and, and learn passageways rather than, like, worry about how quickly you're dying. Yeah. And... I always worry about of... how quickly you're dying, Greg. Ah, every <laughs> day. <laughs> yeah. And that's one of the key differences I, I wanted to make in that I still think the whole... Basically, I'm still okay with mazes, but um, that balance is... I think just all the more important, especially with the standard gameplay, and it's there was Zelda a, Two. There was, 
there was one game that I had a lot of trouble with because it was hard and really didn't feel like it could have helped it and like I don't really feel like it explained it very well at all. How do I describe it? What, wait, what was the game? The Oracle of a Oracle of Ages. That's interesting. There was a certain dungeon. It was the water one. It was so unclear what changed whenever I hit a certain lever. Oh, I know exactly what you're talking about. That I sounds played, gross. I played Oracle of Ages, and there's a dungeon. Yeah, where it was either the water level dungeon. Which tipple? It was definitely the water one. It doesn't hold your hand, and it really should have there. Yeah, it was. It was like it was. So that's like a feedback issue, right? Like you, you go up three stories, you hit a switch, and the water levels change on all the floors below it. But it's like hard to tell how much they changed, and like how many different um, options you have to raise and lower the water until you trek all the way back down. And then I, I went up and down so many unnecessary times because I'm like, wait a minute, uh, and like go back up. Wait a minute. Uh. It's not and, like an Ocarina of Time where you can just look down. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was not. It's not as intuitive as Ocarina of Time because that game was played on a small Game Boy Color screen. And uh, Bok Bo Tai for GBA had a similar thing where you're hitting switches and then you're affecting stuff off screen a lot, and you're like, "Oh my gosh, I hope this isn't a hard puzzle or a hard dungeon challenge." And like, like kind of what you're saying, it's about feedback, and like, there's nothing particularly or intellectually interesting about not giving the players enough tools to make smart choices. It's like mm -hmm. it's like making a test or like assigning a test in school and having it be over the next chapter that nobody's read. You're like, is that worth any of our time? <laughs> like, no, it's not actually. <laughs> like, and then, and then tests are supposed to be, you know, when they're testing what you know about things they tell you that are gonna be on the test so you can know it because there's just too many things to know in the world. <laughs> So you like you test a specific thing, you give them the tools and the opportunity to rise to the occasion, and then you test it, and then that's it, right? Mm -hmm. You don't give me the feedback I need to learn. What am I doing? Just sitting there guessing and trying over and over. I always disliked the games that weren't clear to me because I can understand like the whole view on trying to be like, not holding your hand and stuff, but like I really liked games that really made things clear enough to where I could get it without feeling stupid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like... So you should play Starseed Pilgrim. <laughs> wow. That, that was sarcasm. Recommendation. Yeah. That yeah. recommendation. Seriously. Alright, I don't have too much time. Let's finish the video. So, and, okay. Uh, oh, no, no, it's not your fault. Yeah, it's, no, obviously, no, no. it's obviously my fault. <laughs> Thank you for taking right. the plan for me. <laughs> Alright, here we go. It's worth noting that I got completely and utterly lost in both Super Metroid and Axiom Verge, but that's okay because players have to know they can get a bit lost to feel that sense of satisfaction when they finally figure out the way. Like how after you're trapped down in the claustrophobic depths of Norfair for what feels like an eternity, you're finally able to escape. You climb up this long chamber, literally blow your way out with a super bomb, and break out onto the surface, only to realise that you're right back at the very beginning of the game. But now you're way more powerful and adept, and you're ready to get lost all over again as you delve into all the areas you couldn't access back then. It's these narrative arcs that okay. make Metroid games so great, but they work best when you're given permission to get lost, when you're encouraged to explore, and when you're rewarded for having a good memory. So long may this genre live on, but hopefully the critical success of Axiom Verge will encourage more developers to stop telling us exactly where to go, and just let us get a bit lost. Thanks for watching. If you want to see a Metroidvania that does something completely different with backtracking, click the screen for my video about Toki Tori 2, and please consider liking this video, leaving a comment, or supporting the show on Patreon. Okay. So I, just that's... Have, I just have a quick question. Mm -hmm. Does anybody here ever like getting lost and saying, what do I do? And then what do you think <laughs> ever? Uh, I do. I generally I think that's a pleasant feeling. Especially when you ask uh, Google, right? It's a real pleasant feeling. Hey Google, what do I do next? Thanks Google. Back when I was a kid, GameFAQs told me all sorts of great lies. Ooh, <laughs> I can play as the boss if I go do it without getting hit. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, I gotta, I gotta dip out. I'll just say this one last thing about the getting lost. I mean, 
you know, the, the video didn't make sort of a sophisticated enough analysis on exactly a particular kind of getting lost, but there's a difference between getting lost um, and having all the pieces in front of you and then assembling them. And that's just kind of like a natural um, puzzle, a, a natural consequence of learning anything, right? You're assembling the pieces, you're synthesizing the information, you're learning how they connect. And there's always a feeling of like, whoa, like a, right when the complexity gets a little bit too much to be, so you can't guess and check your way through naturally. And right when it gets a little too much to where you have to actually remember things in order to build up a more complex model of whatever you're dealing with. Everyone has these feelings where, you know, you don't know enough and you're trying to rely on knowledge to get you through it. So in a very, in a very um, low level sense, it's easy to get lost and experience that feeling in a game where it's all just about a maze, right? A twist of turns and you don't know which twists and turns to go in. But it happens all the time with conceptually, it happens all the time with just about every video game that's skill-based and you gotta take your skills to that next level. So in particular, it's not about, it's not that games don't have more of this feeling and getting lost and it's not, a, it's not like it doesn't happen all the time. And the more, the interesting thing to look at is, okay, well, how do games create these spaces both that become increasingly complex and then two how do they teach you uh what's going on and then three the moment you are most likely to get lost what is the the learning environment like around you like are your clues like handy like in your menu on your character in the direct environment or is it something you have to guess and check or run all the way back to an old area to remind yourself of or like all these different things it's so sophisticated but just the very fact of like sometimes you won't know where to go so keep exploring hallways and you'll eventually get there is not exactly um it doesn't exactly articulate the level of sophistication in super metroid versus so many other games that copy its level design format nice so yeah get smart don't get lost <laughs> you just, you know, puzzle games do that all the time. They tell you all the stuff you need to know, and you're sitting there staring at it, trying to put all the pieces together conceptually. But for good puzzle games, it's not about um, did I not flick a switch randomly on a random hallway. It's just like what's what's right before me, and then what's going on. And that's how all you know good education systems and testing systems should be. Like nobody really cares about your ability to remember something they didn't tell you was important. <laughs> Do you remember what colors my shoes were on day three, says the teacher? No, says the student. I was focused on biology. <laughs> yeah. I did get more of a feeling of what it was he was, be, what it was he enjoyed, but it made me think a lot of, because what he said was, oh, it's, it's, he, he basically summarized it to the satisfaction of getting unlost, like what you like about getting lost is the part where you stop being lost. Like that's what you just said. And it's not, and then seeing an old, it's an old area I've been to, and now I'm dicked out with new weapons and okay. I don't know why, but it just kind of just made me think of like a more, I don't, I don't want to say dumb, but kind of a dumber appreciation of like action games where it's like, Oh, the part that I liked, and it's kind of I, I am going to talk about Ninja Gaiden for like the 80th time where it's like oh the only part that I liked about this game was that I was stuck and I was it was beating me and I was doing the same part over like 60 times but then I finally got it and then you get that rush of you know victory and satisfaction and that what he was describing here sounded reminded me a lot of that and I feel like that's such a like I don't know like a, a low level appreciation of the game well it sounded like he also enjoyed the process of putting all the clues together right to reach that point i think he did say that it rewarded you for memory but that was like the only part but he seemed to stress the aspect of satisfaction more because throughout yeah. this whole video he hasn't really been talking about you know the more sophisticated things um in metroid well right that uh, last shit, shit. could have been like a lot longer yeah 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 it, it really could have yeah mark brown tends to open up a lot more topics and cans of worms towards the end of his videos in the beginning and that's just kind of how it goes is he going fishing yeah certainly <laughs> uh, but it sounds like that whole idea of you it's it's good to get a little lost first so you know it's more satisfying when you find it like maybe maybe not like whatever some people i think it's interesting to 
I don't know. That's like saying, okay, here's a, here's a challenging situation. It's called shoot this free throw. Okay. Now some kid steps up, it shoots the ball, and it, it completely fails. They're like, you must practice shooting free throws. You're like, oh, I have to be bad first before I be good. And then he practices and shoots, and he's like, yes, this feels so good. And then another kid steps up. He's like, what is this? Shoot the free throw. And he's like, you know, Stephen Curry. He like shoots all the shots from any place on the court. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm great at basketball. And like, it doesn't mean that the experience is like not as in, not interesting or as interesting for the person who's naturally good at it as a person who had to learn how to shoot basketball and coordinate their body and go from a state of like, I suck to I'm pretty good. So I don't think, I mean, sure, like narratively wise, some bumps in the road in your journey makes more interesting, dramatic stories. But in real life, we'd rather not have bumps sometimes. And sometimes when you key in on what a game's teaching you and you absorb its 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 uh, teaching style and you keep your eyes open and you're on your toes, you can get through stuff smoothly. And that is also a really cool feeling. <laughs> like that's really significant yeah. and it feels good and things are just clicking and working and your brain feels good and you don't have to necessarily get lost in order to have something of a good feeling like that. And, yeah, to, and I, for I've, the game to work. I, I found a better way to say my point and it's that it, it he didn't go enough into like why were you getting lost because to me if i ever am stuck with a hard challenge or i'm facing you know like a mega man boss like to me like this is the difference between my satisfaction and dissatisfaction would say that last palace in zelda 2 versus you know any of the metroid games or you know fighting a really hard you know mega man 10 boss versus you know playing the last level of you know ninja gaiden is like okay why am I taking so long on this? Is it because, you know, there are some things that I'm missing? Is it because, you know, I'm not paying attention? Or is it because I just need to practice and get better? Or is it just because, you know, I'm going through these, in this case of Zelda 2, I'm just going through an endless series of left and right hallways. It's taking so long and I'm going through like this kind of meh action gameplay and I'm starting to forget things halfway and it's just taking really long. Like if that is the description, like I think that's important in, kind of this thing like how am i getting lost like or know, what even counts as getting lost yeah what what counts as getting lost why am i getting lost and when i get myself unlost like what was the reason for it hmm. it's not enough just to say like if i'm playing an action game that oh you you got stuck and you got your unstuck isn't that the cool part it's like no i kind of care why i got stuck in the first place is it because the stupid hitbox on ryu sword has fewer <laughs> active frames than what the animation actually lasts which <laughs> really pees me off you i really don't the, like uh, that hitbox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i sure did yeah uh, i think a lot of people in their in their quest to try to talk about games and understand games better uh <clears throat> confuse taking the experience they have with it and then directly applying that to design instead of talking about the nature of the system itself which can allow for many kinds of experiences they tend to gravitate too strongly for, towards one experience and probably the one experience they've had and try to tell you why the game is like directly that you know like well that's not that's not that's a backwards way of trying to talk about design and we're, we're really concerned with the nature of the, ex the game itself and its potential to be many things, even if you don't ex experience all those on your first playthrough, a second, or ever, right? So we're talking about how a game teaches and maybe what it's likely to do and how it's try what it's trying to do rather than, I got stuck at the game, I think this game stinks, I got lost, I think it's more meaningful because I was a bonehead and I didn't pay attention to any of the text box because I thought I was too good and too cool for school, right? So like, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people are just looking at end results and then doing the much more difficult task of trying to reverse engineer design to match their experience. And that's, that's, that's not going to lead to very many fruitful places. Right. All right, guys, I gotta go. Fun talk. Later. Cool. Have a good haircut. Peace out. I'll talk to Greg later, but <laughs> not either of the other two. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> All right, guys, later. See ya. Later. Yeah, okay. I'm interested. Oh, anything else anyone had to say before I call this a session? We well, can call it a session, just don't end it. <laughs> um, no, I'm satisfied. What about you, Nick?
Yeah, I'm pretty good. I like this. I didn't say too much, but I feel like everyone else said everything that needed to be said. Yeah, that... <laughs> I definitely feel that sometimes where it's like I'm sitting in conversation and everyone's saying all the good stuff. But yeah, I'm actually pleasantly surprised with how this turned out. We managed to squeeze an hour of, pro of really, really good meaty conversation out of a, what, seven minute? Not even seven minute because that last minute's like, you know, check out my stuff. It's like out of a six minute video. Um, <laughs> yeah. So no, that was pretty good. I guess the only thing I'll throw in is that uh, I still, you know, it, is that it was a balanced thing and I still appreciate the left and right mazes kind of thing. It's just that is also the kind of thing that's easier to overwhelm. And that's why I still say the same thing about Metroid is that it's the Metroid 1 and 2 are still the only ones that you could do without maps. Um, but it's also, and they're just, just, um, big enough that you can do them in one session to where you can get the whole thing right because um lord knows even in zelda dungeon it's not those their zelda dungeons are long enough that you can play in one sitting but it's never at all a good idea to like play the water temple stop halfway through and come back to it later that is a massive headache like it's never a good idea to do that and the great part of the design is you can't get them the whole things in one go you remember the uh when we talked about mazes in um, Realms of the Haunting. Yes. Yeah. Wait, what specifically? Well, just reflecting on um, what it's like to have to go through an area in one session. And also, um, Richard reminded me of it earlier when he was talking about how um, what we what tools the game gives us to get unlost and uh, if we're just taking every first left turn or what. And um, certainly Realms of the Haunting does as little as possible to help the player. It does as little and sometimes it also... I mean, in that game, it does actually give you a map. So sometimes it literally is just walk around and look at the map because there's that one hedge maze that um, because it's so labyrinthine, it... um it's specific it, it's basically a counter to the always take a left turn try to explore the outer your outer edges kind of you know searching that i usually yeah. do um so that one was just actually oh just look at the map and that clears things up a whole lot it also um and but the brain maze where there was no map oh, um that yeah. one was just in I some mean, ways it's kind of interesting in some ways it was kind of interesting as you get to find out a trick to it but it was also kind of time consuming and there was a lot of sp space you had to go through and just so many brains yeah it mm, that that one definitely does fall more on the questionable side for me because um that did take a long time and that's the problem is like if it's just a, a maze like that you kind of want to i don't know don't make that too long because that's an example is oh it was it's getting lost isn't that awesome right and it's like i'm just going around through a bunch of hallways trying to pick up brains <laughs> i don't know how awesome you can make that I to me like oh, yeah nick i was just gonna say i remember when i got lost in that dungeon though when oracle of ages i wanted to die Oof. yeah that not, sounds not, weird not really. that but it was one of those times in which i felt I did not understand why this franchise was good at all. Oh, was this one of your that, first games with it? It was the first Zelda game I ever played, and it was fun up until that point in which I felt like all the fun had suddenly stopped. Oh, man. It, the way Richard described it sounded very odd to me, because normally, because the only water temple in a 2D Zelda game that I know of is the one in Link to the Past, but there, it's the water is very clear but when he was talking about it, he's talking about like it's the water temple ocarina time where there's multiple levels and i'm like right. wait doing that in a 2d zelda game sounds like a really really bad idea and it is it apparently it was because it didn't sound like he was speaking favorably of it either and he um i right said it was a feedback issue because things were happening off screen, which is the worst way to do that kind of water thing. In Link to the Past, you see it rise right in front of you. Because there's neat only about, like one level. 
Uh, oh, no, never mind. That's off topic. The best way to describe the water temple is you have a thing that lets you dive, but you're only, but you're only allowed to dive in water in specific rooms in certain parts. Huh. So it's not like the 3D where you could go in the water and deep down and look around underwater. Yeah. Uh, is, in and 3D and see. Room and see the, where the specific changes are. Hmm. Because Sorry. they can't render things in polygons, there's not any like easy way to give a sense of space in 2D. Yeah, the most uh, 3D they've ever made it for the Link to the Past was going to a higher floor and then dropping down into a lower one. Sometimes you'll drop down through straight through two floors, and that's the most they've done it. Um, yeah, I think if you played Link Between Worlds, you'd have some like subtle border cases where it's not quite linked to the past it's like a little more than linked to the past and a little less than ocarina of time see it's that a sequel, so. link yeah. between worlds to me is and um also the ds games they're interesting because they're actually 3d so even though they're still play from the top down perspective where it's still basically a 2d game but because the game's in 3d you can actually see those levels of depth more clearly than in a 2D game. Right, exactly. And... Do, 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 do. What else am I thinking? We were talking about mazes. And then we were, I was talking about the brain maze. Realms of the Haunting. See, this is something I learned about myself. And is that my short-term memory isn't that great. And yet somehow I enjoy Metroid games. I figure that out. <laughs> the human mind can store seven plus or minus two things at a time yeah and that's the thing is um even it's i i feel like i'm the only person or except for you greg because where it's like man i didn't think the original metroid was that confusing it's like yeah you gotta check a bunch of rooms but it's like i feel like that's an okay part of the game and it there's just enough to not make it too annoying because the thing is like every dead end there's going to be a power up there i I don't, there's not that many dead ends where there's absolutely nothing in it. I don't yeah, think. I guess, like, uh, you know, Metroid 1 and Brain Maze are on opposite sides of the fence where, like, Metroid is just barely interesting enough that the uh, loosey-goosey map design is worth it, and then Realms of the Haunting Brain Maze is just uninteresting enough that <laughs> having really an articulate map design sucks. Yeah, I, I was because th the thing is when I found the trick in the brain maze, it was that was because I was doing laps and figuring, OK, how are right. these things even structured that I can maybe suss out some kind of pattern? Because remember, that's a 3D game and it's harder to suss that out the relative space between those passages because you're going through tunnels and that's why it took so much longer. Uh, 2D games are 2D. They don't have that kind of problem, but um, with and still with Metroid, the other thing, and this is the point I gotta concede, is part of the other reasons why I probably had an easier time was because of the screw attack, where I'm able to just breeze through Ridley's and Craig's layers uh, without having to, um, you know, uh, get curb stomped by a side hopper. Right. While, you know, figuring out where, where do I go, where have I been and haven't I been. <laughs> 